Welcome to the Farm Gened, Bridging the Gap Between Science and Practice, Train to Trainer Session on Psychiatry 2 and Psychotics on Tuesday, August 24, 2010. This presentation is supported by a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Today's agenda includes an introduction of the overall objective of farm genetic curriculum, the author of the educa educational content, the review of educational content for the antipsychotic area. We will announce future webinar dates as well as our contact information. We'll also provide a brief introduction of the survey instruments as well as a, uh, we'll end with a question and answer session. The overall objective of the Sound Farm Genet Program is an evidence-based pharmacogenomics education program designed for pharmacists and physicians, pharmacy and medical students, and other healthcare professionals. The overall objective of the Farm Gen Ed program is to increase awareness about current knowledge of the validity and utility of pharmacogenomic tests and the potential implications of benefits and harms from use of the tests. We have nine educational materials, each lasting one hour or 60 minutes, from asthma, cardiology one and two, concepts and clinical applications, economic issues, oncology one and two, and psychiatry one and two. These webinar dates for future sessions will be provided later. The format of the therapeutic area discussion today will be the following. We'll present a patient case, gene and or allele of interest, functional effect of these genes or alleles, population prevalence, the clinical relevance divided into dosing and selection literature, efficacy and toxicity literature. We'll also provide genomic tests and testing recommendations if available, as well as an end with a patient case summary. Today's author is Dr. Jeffrey Bishop, Assistant Professor of Pharmacy and Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago. In this role, he conducts psychopharmacology and pharmacogenomics research with a primary focus on antipsychotic drugs in early course schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. He's a board-certified psychiatric pharmacist and serves as a clinical pharmacist in psychiatry, medical resident supervisor in the outpatient psychosis clinic. Additionally, he is a PGY-1 and PGY-2 pharmacy resident research supervisor and also teaches antipsychotic pharmacology to PharmD, MD, PhD students, and residents at UIC. He earned a degree in biology at Luther College and went to complete his doctor of pharmacy degree at University of Iowa. He also completed a fellowship in clinical psychopharmacology and pharmacogenetics at the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy, as well as a master's degree in clinical investigation through University of Iowa College of Pharmacy, College of Medicine. His, his clinical research interests are primarily devoted to schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. Currently, he's a principal investigator of a NARSAD and NIMH-funded studies of antipsychotic pharmacogenomics. We welcome Dr. Bishop. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, first, we'll go over some of the learning objectives here, and then we'll get into the, the, the therapeutic content of the, of the talk today. And, uh, and for the learning objectives upon completing the program, you'll be able to identify specific drug therapies that are used uh, where pharmacogenetic testing can be applied in the clinical setting. Uh, evidence for or not supporting this in the context of antipsychotic drugs. Uh, you'll be able to summarize the evidence-based recommendations for pharmacogenetic testing uh, relevant to antipsychotic medications. And again, apply this to a, a patient case scenario to, for, to formulate a plan for pharmacogenomic testing uh, or not testing based on the available scientific evidence. So, as Kelly mentioned, today's, uh, today's topic is going to be on antipsychotic medications. And antipsychotics are primarily indicated for the treatment of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism spectrum disorders, augmentation of antidepressants for a major depressive disorder, as well as for other psychosis, psychosis spectrum uh, disorders. 
Now, pharmacogenetic studies of these agents uh, can be broadly divided into two categories, those which uh, investigate genetic predictors of response and those uh, investigating predictors of side effects from these medications. Now, I think um, while the indications for antipsychotic medications are for a number of different disorders, I think it's important to note that most of the pharmacogenetic studies done with these drugs have been conducted in patients uh, with schizophrenia. So uh, we're, we're going to move we're going to move through starting with a patient case and then uh, moving into the uh, biology and the, the study supporting um, or the supporting the evidence for or against uh, testing for particular variants in uh, uh, genes related to antipsychotic response and side effects. Uh, as I go through this, I'll try to do a little bit of annotation so that uh, you get a feel for uh, points that you may want to highlight when you're uh, uh, presenting this to your students or or other trainees. So I think the duration of the talk that I'm giving may be a slightly bit longer than what it would actually take you to, to go through the slides, but uh, I'll try to do so with, with uh, providing additional information that may be helpful. So we'll start out, first of all, with a patient case. And the patient case is a 24-year-old uh, Caucasian male diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia who presents to the local university health center. Uh, the chief complaint is the voices are so loud that I can't concentrate. Uh, this is a gentleman who is uh, 6 feet tall, 185 pounds, with a BMI of about 25. Uh, uh, history of present illness is that the patient has been hearing derogatory voices in increasing frequency over the past few months, and he also has paranoid delusions about the government tracking his movements by satellite. So this is an individual experiencing uh, two uh, primary core uh, symptom clusters of schizophrenia, those being uh, hallucinations and delusions. Uh, a little more background on this patient. He uh, smokes cigarettes, which is, uh, which is not all on that uncommon in patients with schizophrenia, and reports intermittent marijuana use. He has a family history reported as an uncle on his father's side as uh, being odd, and a father uh, who has had a heart attack at uh, approximately age 61. Now, I put these two things in here for uh, perhaps for a little bit of discussion if you want. One is that uh, schizophrenia has a significant genetic component to it, although it is not known to be a Mendelian disorder, that being uh, one gene, uh, variation in one gene causes the disease. Rather, it is a genetically heterogeneous uh, uh, condition where, uh, in fact, approximately 20 to 30 genes have been associated with schizophrenia in at least one or more association or family linkage study of the disease. So that may be one thing that, you, that can get brought up is for, for in the context of having a, a family member who may be experiencing some uh, odd or abnormal symptoms. Uh, secondly, the father has a cardiovascular event at a relatively young age. Um, and this may be relevant in the context of drugs that, per, that result in uh, metabolic side effects that uh, may be relevant here. So this patient is prescribed olanzapine uh, and has good response and tolerability, and after six months the patient complains of a 40-pound weight gain, which has increased his BMI to greater than 30. So the weight gain is concerning to the patient, prescriber, and family, given the, given the family history of cardiovascular disease. Uh, the patient, as uh, many of our patients do, did some uh, investigation on the Internet and in inquires whether pharmacogenetic testing could uh, help uh, us predict his risk for side effects from other drugs. So this is a patient who has some insight to know that his, pa his symptoms are getting better, but he doesn't like the side effects. Psychiatrist, on the other hand, uh, is also thinking about side effects, but also wonders if pharmacogenetic testing can predict the likelihood of the patient's re response to additional drugs. So uh, one thing that's difficult to predict when you switch from one antipsychotic to another is whether uh, the patient will exhibit the same degree of response when uh, going to the new drug. So side effects are a little more, uh, a little easier to, uh, to predict um, so going from a drug that causes a lot of weight gain to one that, that on average causes less weight gain is more predictable than switching response. 
uh, based on a response profile. And so since this patient has a good response, the, uh, the risk of losing that response is significantly is concerning. So when we think about um, antipsychotic pharmacogenetics, the overall goal of this is essentially to find a balance between the good things that these drugs do and the potentially uh, severe side effects that we know that are, are commonly observed with uh, these drugs. Uh, we know that side effects as well as response uh, are highly variable from patient to patient, and essentially it's our hope that genetic studies may help us account for some of this heterogeneity to better inform our treatment, treatment selection and dosing decisions. And so, so uh, from a clinical standpoint, our choice of, of uh, therapeutic agents depends on a number of different things. Uh, the types of symptoms that a patient presents with, uh, the side effect uh, profile that's associated with a given drug, drug interactions, uh, with uh, agents they uh, previously responded to or not responded to, their adherence, uh, financial uh, aspects, formulation considerations, as well as other things such as pregnancy, age, hepatic and renal impairment. So when we think about side effects from, uh, from these drugs, there's, there's a number of different side effects that antipsychotics have. I would say that for, for the for purposes, purposes of focusing this discussion uh, in pharmacogenetics, we're going we're gonna to focus on uh, the two big uh, symptom clusters, that uh, side effect clusters that really bother patients, and those are metabolic disturbances and extrapyramidal side effects. So the metabolic disturbances are commonly observed with second-generation agents. So those are newer drugs such as clozapine, olanzapine, as well as the others that are listed here. And uh, the, the, the degree of weight gain in metabolic disturbances uh, differs across drugs where clozapine and olanzapine have the greatest um, likelihood to induce these effects, effects while ziprazidone and aripiprazole have the lowest likelihood. Extrapyramidal side effects, on the other hand, are movement disorder-related side effects that uh, were commonly observed when uh, first-generation agents, such as uh, uh, drugs like haloperidol, um, were, were used in the 70s and early 80s. And so EPS, or extrapyramidal side effects, are commonly observed from these agents as well as higher doses from some second-generation drugs. And so these can involve uh, dystonia, which is abnormal muscle tone, so this would be like muscle cramping, oculogenic crisis, those types of things. Uh, Pseudoparkinsonism can result from dopamine blockade in the nigrostriatal dopamine tract, so you result in uh, uh, akinesia, slow, that means slow movement, mask facies, reduced facial expression, uh, tremor, uh, things that mimic Parkinson's disease. Acathesia is in a feeling of inner restlessness and tardive dyskinesia, which will be a focus of our pharmacogenetic investigations, is a, it essentially means late onset abnormal muscle movements, which uh, is uh, uncontrollable and potentially irreversible uh, uh, cluster of, of, of side effects that um, can be severely stigmatizing, debilitating, and dangerous. So, when we look at the genes and alleles of interest, we're going to focus the discussion today on, on, uh, on, on four, different, four different genes, two for response and two for side effects. So in the context of response, uh, the studies that we'll talk about focus on the dopamine 2 receptor gene as well as the serotonin 2A receptor gene. And within that, there are a number of different variants in these two genes that have been investigated for associations with uh, response to antipsychotics and schizophrenia. What I've tried to do is pare this down to those that have some biological uh, relevance as well as uh, replicated data across studies. So we have uh, two variants in the promoter region of the dopamine 2 receptor gene, so that would be the minus 241A to G SNP, as well as the minus 141C insertion deletion SNP for DRD2. And the insertion deletion SNP is such that the deletion of the C allele results in a decreased dopamine 2 receptor expression. Uh, the, the, Biology of the minus 241 SNP is a little more undefined, but we're, but uh, is is also thought to affect gene expression as well. On the other end of the gene is the TAC1A polymorphism, 
where the A1 or the T allele is associated with decreased uh, uh, dopamine 2 receptor expression and D2 binding. And uh, the 957C to T SNP is thought to be in linkage to equilibrium with that and also affects uh, dopamine 2 receptor gene expression. Serotonin 2A has three SNPs that are commonly studied in antipsychotic uh, pharmacogenetic investigations, C102T, uh, uh, histidine 452-tyrosine, and minus 1438-A-G. Um, most of the studies have investigated this 102C uh, to T polymorphism, but really that is in linkage dis disequilibrium with this promoter SNP, the minus 1438 variant. And it's thought that the uh, 1438 SNP is actually the biological, uh, re resulting in the biological effect. So the G variant, uh, which is also the C variant of the 102 SNP, um, is associated with decreased serotonin 2A receptor expression. Okay, so from the side effect standpoint, we have uh, the serotonin 2C receptor gene for investigations of of uh, metabolic effects and weight gain from antipsychotic drugs, as well as the dopamine 3 receptor gene for tardive dyskinesia and abnormal involuntary movements. And again, uh, there's a number of different SNPs that have been studied. However, I tried to pare this down to the variants that have the most evidence for uh, replication, and that is the uh, promoter region variant 759C to T SNP in the serotonin 2C receptor gene. Uh, as well as the serine to glycine polymorphism at amino acid number 9 in DRD3. One thing that's important to note is that uh, serotonin 2C is located on the, uh, is located on the X chromosome. Um, so there is some thought that that may result in, in uh, uh, sex-specific differences that, that um, may result in some heterogeneity across studies. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on in the presentation. I think in order to put uh, the functional consequences of these uh, polymorphisms in a uh, in broader context, it's important to talk about the functional effects of these receptors as they relate to uh, antipsychotic treatment. And so um, there are a number of different antipsychotics that are currently used in the United States. Uh, we, we generally divide these into first and second generation agents as, as classes within the, the antipsychotic group. So first generation, uh, which some people call typical antipsychotics, um, include agents like chlorpromazine, sothorazine, or uh, haloperidol, haldol, as well as a number of others. And second generation agents, uh, such as newer drugs, such as clozapine, olanzapine, risperidone, um, aripiprazole, et cetera. So from a mechanistic standpoint, all currently approved antipsychotic drugs block dopamine 2 receptors as one of their primary mechanisms of action. And D2 receptor antagonism is generally accepted as one mechanism that is, uh, is responsible for the improvement of positive symptoms in schizophrenia. So positive symptoms are things that uh, patients gain as a result of the disease, such as hallucinations and delusions, things that our 25-year-old are, are, uh, are uh, uh, patient in the case had. The other gene of interest is serotonin 2A uh, receptor gene. Uh, now, so serotonin 2A receptors are, are, are commonly blocked by uh, second-generation agents, so the newer drugs. So, while well, the, they also block D2 receptors in addition to serotonin 2A receptors. And this is, was originally hypothesized to result in some of the negative symptom or cognitive symptom improvements that, were, that some people see from the second generation agent. So negative symptoms are things that patients lose as a result of disease, such as uh, emotional expressivity or uh, organization, um, uh, motivation, uh, those types of things. Uh, blockade of serotonin 2A receptors is also thought to account for uh, some of the reduced experimental side effects of dopamine 2 blockade in the nigrostriatal pathway uh, dopamine tract in the brain. 
from the other side effect uh, spectrum, we have the, the serotonin 2C receptor gene, which, is, uh, which, which modulates uh, satiety and appetite. Uh, so if you, uh, essentially if you block these receptors or knock these receptors out in rodent models of disease, you get um, uh, big, fat, fluffy mice. Um, and there's some data that shows that uh, an interaction between the uh, serotonin 2C receptor as well as the leptin um, signaling pathway to modulate uh, appetite. The dopamine 3 receptor gene is interesting in that it is structurally related to the dopamine 2 receptor and has some um, uh, regulatory and substrate uh, binding characteristics that are similar to the dopamine 2 receptor gene. Um, and what, what happens is in the context of antipsychotic administration, you get an upregulation of uh, dopamine 3 receptors in the striatum. Um, uh, the striatum, the ventral putamen, and the basal ganglia, which, is, uh, which are regions associated with motor control. And so what happens is you get, a, as a result of antipsychotic uh, administration, you get an upregulation of this. And then in the context of, of genetic variants that um, alter the affinity to uh, dopamine, you may get differential uh, risk for side of, uh, movement related side effects from these drugs. So it's also relevant uh, when, when you're thinking about these um, uh, thinking about these polymorphisms to consider the population prevalence of uh, the variants that, that, that we're that we're discussing. So this is um, so from the standpoint of, of this, uh, it's relevant to look at the minor allele frequencies of, of uh, the, the variants that are associated with the, um, uh, the different polymorphisms. And I'm sorry, I've, I'm experiencing a little bit of delay in um, scrolling over to that uh, particular slide. Um, anyway, from the and what I did here was I, I presented ranges of the minor allele SNPs for the different polymorphisms. And these, this data is, is uh, allele frequency data that's been derived from uh, HapMemp information, which uh, summarizes data from Caucasians, African, uh, Chinese, and Japanese populations that was accessed through uh, the National Center for Bio. Uh, biotechnology, so the NCBI website, so you can plug in any of these RS numbers and, and identify the specific allele frequencies. Um, uh, briefly, just to give you some uh, context here, the, the A241G SNP for DRD2 uh, is pretty rare, doesn't ex exhibit a whole lot of uh, population variability. Uh, the 141 insertion deletion SNP um, is, has a lower the, the, the deletion has a lower frequency in Caucasians. Uh, for the 957C to T SNP for uh, DRD2, you have a wider range. And actually, you have a lower frequency. Um, you have the T allele that is minor for Africans, Chinese, uh, and Japanese uh, individuals, whereas it's common in uh, Europe, people of European ancestry. So that's why you have a minor allele frequency that goes above 0.5. Uh, TAC1A. The T allele, which is also called the A1 allele, is the minor allele, and this has a lower frequency in Caucasians. And I will, I'll, I'll include uh, some of these details in the notes section of the slides for your review when you're, when you're going through the lecture uh, preparing. Uh, uh, moving on to serotonin 2A, uh, you, have, you have the uh, C102T SNP and the 1438 SNP. Uh, that essentially have very similar allele frequencies, and assessing one is, a, is essentially um, a proxy for the other. And again, the biological SNP is probably the 1438 uh, variant in the promoter region. Uh, the HIS-452 tier SNP is, uh, is a little bit more rare. Uh, it's very uncommon in Asian, uh, so those be, uh, being Japanese or Han Chinese populations. Uh, minor allele frequency is about 8% in Caucasians and 16% in African. Serotonin 2C, T allele is uh, the variant and is more common in Asian populations. And DRD, for DRD3, uh, the, the serine to glycine polymorphism 
uh, is such that the glycine amino acid is the less common, is, is the variant and is less common in, in Caucasians and Asians, but more common in patients of African ancestry. Okay, so moving on to, to studies of antipsychotic response. Um, this is, so discussing antipsychotic response is, um, uh, is somewhat complex because it's, it's difficult to understand exactly what's causing the symptoms involved with schizophrenia from a biological standpoint, uh, as well as how we define response. And so it's generally accepted that uh, perturbations in either the dopamine, serotonin, or gl glutamate neurotransmitter pathways are uh, somewhat to blame for uh, uh, symptoms and, uh, and risk for schizophrenia. From a treatment standpoint, all antipsychotics we have available right now block uh, dopamine 2 receptors, and all the uh, second generation agents block uh, both uh, dopamine 2 and 5-HT2A. Uh, nothing affects the glutamate system that's currently approved. And it's important to note that not all people respond to these drugs. So uh, the, the, the quest for improved response is something that is it's kind of like an, a holy grail for the treatment of schizophrenia. Now, when we define response, um, this this can be this is this is also relevant because if you uh, depending on how you define response may result in differences across studies and result in some heterogeneity in this data. So generally, when we when we do uh, drug treatment studies of schizophrenia, you are assessing uh, positive symptoms, uh, negative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms of of the disease. And I would say, generally speaking, from the from a pharmacogenetic standpoint, um, they're generally using primary outcome variables that are derived from total score scales on on uh, on a measure such as a brief psychiatric rating scale, a positive and negative syndrome scale, or a scale for uh, uh, schizophrenia disorders. So something that's giving you a global uh, sort of a in insight into the global improvement of symptoms over time. Um, another thing that's important to note is that the definition of what, what constitutes response may differ from place to place. And so I, I like to look at response as a continuous variable, but if you want to dichotomize response so that you can uh, essentially aggregate data across studies, generally 20% uh, improvement uh, in overall symptoms is generally categorized as a, as a good response for schizophrenia. So while 20% improvement is um, uh, nothing to write home about for uh, uh, other disease states, uh, uh, folks with uh, schizophrenia as well as other psychosis uh, spectrum disorders, uh, they're very difficult to treat, and so 20% is a benchmark that's commonly used. And so so we have some heterogeneity in, in what's thought to cause the symptoms and, and how you assess the symptoms. And um, again, from, from the standpoint of response, people have looked at a number of different SNPs, and so replication is, is sometimes difficult. So what I've done is uh, tried to focus on, uh, try, try to focus this in on, on SNPs that, that, that have been replicated and I'm presenting for a response. Uh, one nice prospective study followed by um, uh, some, some more meta-analysis types of, of, of investigations. And so one uh, efficacy study that I'd like to present to students is this investigation by Lentz et al. that was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2006. And this was a study of uh, dopamine 2 uh, promoter region variation and its relationship to antipsychotic response in patients with first episode schizophrenia. Now, the, I think the, the other nice part of the study is that the first episode status of the patients is important to note. Um, when you have uh, patients who are not experiencing, uh, who have had prior antipsychotic exposure, uh, they're more likely to have, um, they're more likely to be treatment resistant populations and they don't necessarily allow you to see um, uh, differences at the genotype level that you might be able to see in patients who are relatively antipsychotic naive. So these were, uh, these were patients that were uh, participants who were randomly assigned to 16 weeks of risperidone or lanzapine treatment. So those are two second-generation agents, both block D2 and 5-HT2A receptors. 
uh, genotype for two promoter region variants in DRD2. And then the time until sustained response was, was defined as uh, two consecutive ratings, uh, so that would be two consecutive two-week ratings without significant positive symptoms, um, as well as uh, an overall response on the clinical global impression improvement scale of moderate to uh, greatly improved. So this next slide here uh, summarizes the, their results where they have, um, you have three panels. You have uh, the two, uh, going from left to right, you have the A two minus 241G SNP on the, on the left and in the middle, uh, results stratified by the minus 141 insertion deletion C SNP. And on the far right, you have uh, their, um, uh, their combination of, of genotypes to try to gain some more insight onto the effects of these variants in response over time. So if you look on the, on the, on the y-axis here, I'm going to try my attempt at the, um, at the writing tool. So here you have the, the, the patients responding to antipsychotic medication over time. So this is the proportion of patients responding, and then on the on the y on the x-axis down here you have time, so uh, you have weeks, and essentially these are Captain Meyer plots that uh, essentially illustrate that you have uh, you have separation in uh, the you have separation in response based on these two SNPs that seems to occur at about 10 weeks, such that. Uh, uh, for the minus 141 insertion deletion uh, C SNP, the patients that are deletion carriers, uh, so those are the individuals who have lower D2 gene expression, have a less robust response, and they have a um, so that they have a they have a, a slower response and they have a less robust response over time. So I think that from the biology standpoint of this, my interpretation is that if these are patients who have schizophrenia but at baseline have lower levels of D2 expression, giving them an antipsychotic agent that blocks D2 is really not, gonna, the, not going to uh, move them as, as far from their baseline from the standpoint of changing D2 uh, receptor transmission as those with higher baseline D2 uh, uh, receptor expression. So, um, over here on the far far right panel, you have diplotype status. Uh, again, I think this is I think this panel is a bit confusing. Um, the the take home here that I that I generally uh, focus on is is this green bar here where you have the deletion variant um, in combination with the the minus 241 uh, uh, 241 genotype. Again, you have a slower and less robust response over time. Um, uh, so I think that's a nice, this is sort of a nice longitudinal uh, investigation of, of schizophrenia response um, and D2 receptor uh, variability. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, there, there are a number of studies that, that investigated the dopamine 2 receptor gene invariants uh, to be related to um, Antipsychotic response again. The number, the variants studied, and the number of variants uh, differs across studies, and so this has uh, resulted in difficulty in, in identifying the causal uh, SNPs to assess for pharmacogenetic tests. So, the previous study is, I think, it's a, it's nice from the the study design standpoint. Um, I, I don't think that the that that necessarily presents evidence that you need to be testing for those particular variants. Um, other common uh, Things that you'll observe across studies is that the effect sizes are so small, but they will be significantly uh, uh, they will be significant from a statistics standpoint. And furthermore, the studies determining the benefit of prospective genotyping have not yet been done. So, um, before we get into uh, discussions of the serotonin 2A receptor data, um, w one look that we uh, we took from a big picture standpoint investigating the clinical relevance of, of efficacy pharmacogenetic studies of antipsychotic drugs was uh, a chapter that we, we published in, the, um, uh, in, in a recent textbook. And 
Um, to give you some, uh, some perspective on how these things replicate across studies for the dopamine 2 receptor gene, three or four studies of clozapine, uh, the one study of olanzapine, and all the studies of risperidone that were published at the time showed positive associations with response. And these were markers in the promoter regions or coding regions. Serotonin 2A, which we'll discuss in a second. Um, uh, seven of 11 studies of clozapine, uh, both the studies of olanzapine, and two out of the three risperidone pharmacogenetic studies showed positive associations between variants and serotonin 2A uh, variants and uh, antipsychotic response. So there, there is growing evidence that these things are replicating across studies. It's just that some of the SNPs that are assessed in these different studies are, um, are, are sometimes different, which makes aggregating data and uh, in generating you know, specific SNPs to assess uh, somewhat difficult. So um, from the serotonin 2A receptor standpoint, I thought it would be nice to, to present um, one meta-analysis that was done in the late 90s that, that summarized data that uh, was obtained from uh, a number of clozapine studies uh, in the treatment of schizophrenia. And so this was a case control pharmacogenetic candidate gene association study with 373 quote-unquote responders and 360 quote-unquote non-responders to clozapine. Uh, they looked at variants in 5-HT2A across studies. Um, and again, these are the, the SNPs that they focused on were the C102T variants and the HIS452 uh, tier SNPs that were evaluated. And again, these are ones that, uh, that alter serotonin 2A mRNA expression in in vitro studies. And essentially, to, to, to cut right to the chase, the 102C allele, so this is, a, this is the SNP that is, results in lower serotonin 2A gene expression it's associated with poor response. Uh, so again, the odds ratio here is about 1.6, so the effect size is relatively small, but highly statistically significant when compared to uh, T carriers, if you look at the uh, CC homozygous versus those that carry the T allele. So, Again, the idea here is that if you have lower gene expression at baseline, uh, administering the agent that uh, further knocks down that receptor is not moving patients that have um, those patients as far as those who have higher gene expression at baseline, if that makes any sense. We can, we can talk about some of this in the discussion section if we, um, if we have time. So um, again, with the, uh, moving on to the next slide, we have uh, efficacy summary of the serotonin 2A gene. Um, I, I presented a, a meta-analysis of, of less robust response for the 102C allele. Uh, I think this is consistent with findings in other second-generation antipsychotics, such as clozapine, olanzapine, and risperidone. Again, similar to the DRD2 variants that we discussed, the effect sizes are small but statistically significant. And again, the studies determining the benefit of prospective genotyping have not yet been done. Okay, so now we'll move on to uh, now we'll move on to side effects. And we'll start a discussion here with antipsychotic uh, associated weight gain. So weight gain is, is something that can be significant, but it's highly variable across individual antipsychotic drugs, uh, as well as individual patients taking the same drugs um, uh, for schizophrenia as well as other psychosis spectrum disorders. Uh, there, there are a number of different neurochemical receptors that are involved in uh, weight gain associated with antipsychotic agents. Uh, this figure uh, shows a number of the various uh, first and second generation antipsychotic agents uh, and the, uh, the degree of weight gain. So on the, on the y-axis you have the de uh, weight gain, uh, change in weight gain um, over time, and on the x-axis you have individual agents. And the, the point is to, uh, um, to sort of illustrate that there's differences across drugs and how much weight is gained after about 10 weeks. Um, 
mechanisms include uh, uh, the blockade associated with uh, antipsychotic drugs for serotonin receptors, histamine receptors, dopamine receptors, as well as alpha adrenergic receptors. Now, one uh, particular gene that has been studied in a number of different uh, pharmacogenetic association studies of, of weight gain from antipsychotic drugs is a serotonin 2C receptor. Uh, serotonin 2C is antagonized by uh, some but not all antipsychotic drugs. Uh, it's blocked by the drugs that tend to have the highest weight gain. So uh, clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine, and risperidone all have high affinity for the serotonin 2C receptors. They all are, uh, I think it's generally accepted, um, they all have the, the highest degree of weight gain with clozapine and olanzapine the, being the greatest offenders. So from a biological standpoint, um, the, the serotonin uh, uh, 2C receptor is important because 5-HT2C uh, agonists are, are, um, are, are involved with uh, treatments for weight gain, so, so weight loss drugs. Um, Again, uh, serotonin 2C receptor is blocked by drugs that cause uh, increase in weight. As I mentioned before, if you, uh, if you knock this receptor out of, of uh, rodent models of, of obesity, uh, you end up getting uh, uh, mice that eat a lot and, and get fat relative to those that don't have this receptor drop, uh, uh, knocked out. And um, essentially, the thought is that antagonizing the, the 5-HT2C receptors via antipsychotics may result in a, uh, uh, it's, it's essentially mimicking a pharmacological knockout or knockdown of this receptor system and a, resulting in a lower capacity to regulate uh, food intake. So here you have um, a polymorphism in the promoter region of this gene, this minus 759C to T SNP where the frequency of the T allele is higher in non-obese subjects and non-diabetic individuals. Uh, furthermore, this T allele is associated with an increased in expression of the 5-HT2C receptor. So the idea is that in the context of Drugs that are blocking or not, are blocking and antagonizing this receptor system, if you're starting out with a baseline of more receptors, you're, it's, it, there will be more residual signaling through uh, the 5-HT2 receptor complex at a given dose of drug in patients with the T allele, and therefore they may be uh, at a lower risk for significant weight gain or gain less weight than those with the C allele. Okay, so uh, a number of investigations have uh, have taken a look at this, and what what I'm presenting here is, a, is data from a meta-analysis that investigated the 759C to T variant of of the 5-HT2C receptor. And so this is a meta-analysis of eight studies of primarily patients that were taking either clozapine or olanzapine with uh, the odds ratios of, of that range anywhere from 0.65 to 21.6 uh, with, with an overall odds ratio of, of 2.3. And so this, these are the odds of, of uh, uh, in favor of the T allele being associated with less weight gain. And so I apologize that this is confusing and it seems like there's, there's double negatives going, uh, occurring here, but from the biology standpoint, I think there's uh, what you'll most commonly hear is that the T allele is thought to be protective and the odds ratio for that protection is summarized as about, about 2.3. So if you look at the, 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 the meta-analysis funnel plot, um, you, you've had th these are the odds ratios in favor of the, the T allele being associated with uh, lower weight gain. You do see some heterogeneity across studies, um, so there is some evidence that there may be some publication bias, but um, uh, generally when you combine data across studies, this is, this is uh, 
generally accepted as being replicated to the 759 T, T allele results in less weight gain. So there's also some indication that there may be a sex effect on some of these outcomes. So with some studies suggesting a more robust association in males. So remember that the uh, HCR2C gene is located on the X chromosome, so males can only be hemizygous for either a C or T allele. And uh, developmental biology informs us that one of the X chromosomes for a female is essentially inactivated during development, which may blunt the effects seen in uh, C, or T C or T allele carriers, although this line of work is, uh, is still being characterized. So when, when these investigators did a, a meta-regression meta analysis, aggregating data across these studies, they looked at the effects of ancestry, age, gender, and, and medication, um, and all these things seem to have some sort of effect in addition to uh, the, the, the 5-HT2C uh, receptor gene. So the clinical relevance of this is that uh, I think in general it's safe to say that the 759T allele is associated on average with less weight gain. Uh, the studies, uh, most of the studies that have, have investigated this have looked at second generation antipsychotics with the largest effects seen in those taking clozapine and olanzapine. So those are the greatest offenders for inducing weight gain and other metabolic side effects from um, uh, resulting from treatment. Again, another common theme that, you, uh, that is observed here is that the effect sizes are small but statistically significant, uh, indicating that we're, we're identifying one potential uh, mechanism and one potential variable is accounting for heterogeneity in the, the side effects that we see across patients but is not, uh, not the entire story. And again, studies determining the benefit of prospective genotyping have not yet been done. So it'd be nice to see a, a large prospective study where, uh, for example, of clozapine or olanzapine treated patients where you, you randomize people to, um, uh, based on their genotype, to either receive olanzapine or clozapine if they have a lower likelihood to gain weight, so say if they have a T allele and then uh, maybe a, another agent if they, if they have a, a, a gene type that's more associated with weight gain, such as the C allele would be uh, randomized to a lower weight gain associated antipsychotics such as aripiprazole. But those studies have not yet been done, so it's hard to really to make recommendations on, on genotyping in clinical practice. A uh, side effect that we... Um, really want to avoid, and actually we really don't see a whole lot anymore, um, is, is tardive dyskinesia. And this is the last, uh, this is the last sort of um, side effect area that we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, and I, th I think currently tardive dyskinesia is relatively underappreciated re relative to where it was uh, 20, 30 years ago, primarily because of our, the number of uh, second generation agents that are used that, um, that have a lower likelihood of this side effect. So tardive dyskinesia is a side effect that was, um, is commonly seen when only drugs like haloperidol and other first-generation um, first generation antipsychotics were primarily used in the 70s and 80s. And this is a side effect seen after long-term treatment with these drugs and, and other drugs as well with high affinity dopamine receptors. Uh, generally, you, you begin to see it after at least six months of, six months of exposure. Um, tardive dyskinesia is characterized by choreiform movements of the face, torso, and extremities. So you get these um, hyperkinetic, twitchy, uh, twitchy involuntary movements of the of them starting in the mouth and face and can move down the core of the body and into the extremities, and this can interfere, interfere with dexterity. Uh, it can be stigmatizing. Patients don't often, always know that, that their, their mouth is twitching or something's going on. Uh, 
it's you know other than being stigmatizing and embarrassing, it can be deadly because this is uh, something that can involve the trunk and diaphragm and esophageal mu- esophageal muscles. So you can think if you start getting diaphragm spasms, it's it's hard to breathe. And the other important uh, uh, concept that um, that I always uh, reinforce to my students is that this may not go away with discontinuation of medication. And so this has the potential to be uh, permanent. Now, the flip side of this is that first-generation drugs such as Haldol and Thorazine are all generically available, and they're a heck of a lot cheaper than the newer second-generation uh, antipsychotic drugs. And so uh, and, and, and furthermore, some studies indicate that these older agents may do just as well from an effectiveness standpoint to the, to the newer drugs, but at a lower financial cost. And so in the context of patients who have reduced financial means, uh, you know, the idea that you might be able to achieve achieve equal efficacy or effectiveness from a cheaper drug is is relatively attractive. However, the risk of these severe movement-related side effects like tardive dyskinesia is a significant deterrent to the long-term use of these older drugs. And so... Uh, and, and this can be anywhere from 12 to 37 uh, percent of patients taking older drugs such as haloperidol, depending on whether somebody's uh, age, so older patients are at risk, uh, their sex, females are at higher risk, uh, higher doses increase risk, and longer duration in, increases risk. So this is this this is a classic uh, side effect that that could be potentially minimized uh, or avoided uh, if we are able to develop a pharmacogenetic test for it. Now, as I mentioned before, the the genotype that has been most commonly studied for its relationship to tardive dyskinesia is this dopamine three receptor variant. It's a serine to glycine polymorphism at amino acid number 9. And just to review, uh, the, the dopamine 3 receptors get upregulated in areas of the brain that are associated with, uh, uh, with, associated with motor control um, in the context of antipsychotic treatment. And the glycine allele confers a higher affinity to dopamine. So if you have upregulation in motor control areas in the context of higher affinity to the uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine, you theoretically have an increase of risk of tardive dyskinesia, which is what this data will uh, will generally show. Uh, so again, what I did here is presented a uh, results of a pooled or meta-analysis to assess the risk of tardive dyskinesia in, in 780 patients uh, with schizophrenia. So. This is, a case, again, a case control uh, candidate gene pharmacogenetic association study of 780 patients, 317 with tardive dyskinesia, 463 without. Uh, again, with uh, follow-up regression analyses to assess the effects of genotype, age, and gender on the outcomes of these studies. And so the reason I like this study is because they have this nice figure that, that sort of presents a stepwise uh, uh, a stepwise increase in the abnormal involuntary movement scale scores based on genotype. So you can see here that uh, the AIMS, which is the, the, the which is one common assessment for tardive dyskinesia in patients with schizophrenia, so their scores get worse uh, in a stepwise fashion based on on genotype. However, again, you have a pooled odds ratio of 1.3 for the glycine allele carriers. Um, again, if you break this out by genotype, it looks like the glyce- those that are homozygous for the glycine, uh, glycine genotype uh, have, have greater abnormal involuntary movement scale scores. So you have an effect size that's small, but one, another thing to keep in, in context here is that if you look at the the y-axis of this scale, the AIM scale score, um, you know, your, your baseline here for this particular patient population is, uh, is an AIMS of, of 4 that increases to uh, an AIMS of about 9 or 10. 
uh, from a clinical standpoint, I mean, I, I, get, I get concerned when we have anybody showing up with uh, muscle twitching, mouth movements that is down in the one or one or two range. So these are patients that were treated with older antipsychotic drugs, and they had to create some threshold for what what was um, what denoted uh, clinically significant uh, tardive dyskinesia. So. So here we may be actually seeing a reduced effect of the genotype based on the fact that they had to select from a patient population that was largely being uh, exposed to high doses of these genotypes, uh, high doses of these older drugs. So in the context of that, you still see a significant result. Um, they, they also identify that there may be some publication bias here as well, um, uh, which I think is still an area of ongoing work. But I do think that... Um, there are some individuals that are doing that are beginning to do studies to randomize patients to by genotype to determine whether these um, it can be an effective test that's implemented in, in in care. So again, to summarize the clinical relevance of this, uh, we have, again have effect sizes that are small but statistically significant, and uh, the the studies looking at the benefit of prospective genotyping have not yet been done, although I think that they are, uh, for this particular variant, um, I think some of these are starting to um, be, be in progress. So now I think the, the whole purpose of putting these modules together is to get an idea for, you know, pharmacogenetic tests that you can use and implement in clinical care so that we can inform our healthcare. Uh, trainees of what's going to be of what's currently available. Uh, I think also it's important to to identify things that may be on the horizon and how some of these studies are done, which is primarily where the data involving antipsychotic drugs uh, falls out. So from the standpoint of pharmacogenetic tests, uh, the D2, 5-HT2A, 2C, and DRD3 tests are not necessarily commercially available. Uh, I will say that they are uh, they are available at some ac academic medical lab medical center laboratories, and there may be direct or consumer places where you can send out uh, samples of of somebody's blood or or DNA to get these assessed. Um, but they are not currently approved uh, by the FD FDA. So uh, I, I do think it's important to understand some of the. That, that these are that these are variants where the data is replicated over time, but the effect sizes are generally small, and so we really need to uh, get some more information on these things. So, from the standpoint of testing recommendations, um, again, they appear to have significant associations with response and side effect outcomes in these research studies of schizophrenia, um, uh, but these tests are not currently FDA approved. Um, and uh, another aspect of this is that uh, because of this, there aren't uh, official recommendations for uh, testing that are included in the antipsychotic pr prescriber information uh, packets. Um, another, another thing that you'll hear about when you listen to the Psychiatry 1 module, I, I believe, is that uh, you also hear about this evaluation of genomic applications in practice and prevention organization. And this is a uh, this is an organization that has been tasked with the development of pharmacogenetic testing guidelines. And uh, it they have not yet reviewed the data for antipsychotic drugs and therefore there's no official opinion from a governmental standpoint on the potential tests for, for these particular drugs. They've looked at data supporting uh, the testing for SSRIs, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, as well as warfarin, uh, as well as a number of anti-cancer uh, anti agents. They haven't assessed the data for antipsychotics. My, my sense is that if they were to look at the state of the data for the variants that I've, I've presented here, that they probably wouldn't support uh, uniform testing across the board for, uh, for all of these, although with um, uh, with increased studies and perhaps some more uh, information that's coming will be coming out down the road, this this may this may change that. But currently, uh, pharmacogenomic tests for antipsychotics are not recommended as um, as standard of care uh, for these particular drugs. So, if we want to bring when we bring this back to 
um, our case summary, uh, we, we, putting this into more of a clinical context, would a genetic test that identifies the presence of the 759C allele enable the prescriber to choose an alternative agent for initial therapy? So if we knew this beforehand, it may that this person was a 759C allele carrier that may have raised a flag that, hey, this person may be, uh, have more robust weight gain from uh, lanzapine or clozapine than uh, somebody who is a T allele carrier, and therefore uh, maybe we should choose something else. I think after, the, after this person has already gained a bunch of weight from a lanzapine, we already know that he's, a, he, he's an individual who's going to gain weight from this, uh, this particular drug, so I don't think that that's extremely informative for us at, at this particular point somewhat after the fact. Now, if the patient was identified as having a dopamine 3 uh, uh, glycine uh, polymorphism at his current state in, uh, in therapy, so now he's thinking about switching drugs, is this, um, does this affect uh, potential uh, or subsequent um, antipsychotic choices? If it was done and the person was in this individual was a, a glycine carrier, that may be uh, that may put first-generation agents uh, lower on the, the selection list, uh, particularly if they're being considered because of financial reasons. I think you have a risk-benefit ratio that might change based on the likelihood for uh, tardive dyskinesia. Um, and again, you want to ask the question, does the serotonin 2A DRD2 genotyping provide any uh, additional, information, uh, additional information at this time? So, uh, to, to summarize in the, in, 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 in the context of this in the context of this case, uh, the D2 uh, receptor, we, we know that there are variants that are associated with response. Um, the heterogeneity is uh, is probably too much to inform specific testing at this time. Uh, 2A C allele is associated with poor response. Uh, 759C allele more weight gain. As I mentioned, would be would have been nice to know earlier than later, but we don't necessarily do this uh, as routine standard of care up front. And the nine uh, glycine allele is associated with higher uh, AIM scale scores, and may put person at risk for uh, tardive dyskinesia from first generation first generation agents. So. Uh, I think we're, we're to the point where we're going to wrap things up and have a, have a bit of a summary here. Um, so we'll just sort of rehash some of the, the information that's been provided over the last hour. Uh, antipsychotic selection and dosing is currently guided by clinical characteristics, individual antipsychotic properties, and prior patient response uh, or outcomes from treatment. Uh, we don't really have any prospective pharmacogenomic studies of antipsychotic drugs where you're randomizing by genotype. We do have prospective studies that have compared outcomes over time and then gone back and looked at whether those outcomes differ by genotypes. But we really don't know whether genotyping improves uh, patient outcomes. Um, I think it's, again, important to emphasize that the antipsychotic drugs uh, are commonly used to treat a number of different uh, number of different disorders, but most of the studies done to date have involved patients with schizophrenia. Uh, they've looked at patient response as well as weight gain and movement disorder related side effects. Again, the genes with replicated pharmacogenomic studies for antipsychotics involve DRD2 for response of clozapine, olanzapine, and risperidone. Serotonin 2A receptor gene for response with again with olanzapine, clozapine, and risperidone. Serotonin 2C with weight gain from clozapine and olanzapine. And tardive dyskinesia with the dopamine 3 receptor gene with haloperidol and other first generation agents. This does not mean that these uh, variants don't apply to other drugs. These are the drugs that have been investigated in the pharmacogenetic studies to date. So, uh, Finally, to wrap, wrap things up, pharmacogenetic tests um, are not currently approved by the FDA and are, are not FD, uh, commercially available from an FDA standpoint, although you may be able to get them at some academic medical centers as well as some direct-to-consumer uh, 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 places. And there are no current recommendations or guidelines for the testing 
um, in, in the prescribing information for, for these antipsychotic drugs, and they're not yet appropriate for routine clinical care. So uh, I appreciate your uh, attention, and um, there are a number of slides that have the references. I think we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll include a lot of the detail that was discussed today in the notes section of, of, of the slides so that uh, you can have access to, or you can, you can look up articles if you want and uh, go over some of the, the, the context and pearls that, that I presented throughout the course of this presentation. Um, Again, uh, thanks to the Farm Jet Ed um, uh, group for putting together this great presentation, and I'd uh, be happy to answer questions uh, that you may have at this time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, for your presentation. At this time, we will now unmute the audience and continue with the webinar by highlighting uh, logistic information as well as a question and answer session. The conference has been unmuted. Oh, no, wait. So if you have any questions about logistics for a uh, farm gen ed program and, uh, and implementation at your schools, please contact me or any of the farm gen ed staff for uh, additional information and how to gain access to this, uh, these materials. I'd like to recognize uh, our whole farm gen ed uh, team as well as our consultants and project coordinator. The following two slides highlight the future webinar dates as well as the completed webinar um, that are already posted on our website. Uh, we have just completed today the Psychiatry 2 and a Psychotics. We will conclude on Thursday with an Oncology 1 uh, on solid tumors, and we also have Cardiology 1, Warfarin and Statins, as well as Cardiology 2 on Clopidogrel and Beta Blockers at the end of September, and finally um, Asthma on September 29th. We also have in October two webinars on economic issues on October 5th, as well as Psychiatry 1 on depression on October 21st. We have already concluded the first session of the program implementation. The exact same uh, content will be repeated on Thursday, September 29th from 10 to 12 p.m. All times are Pacific Standard Time. And this is for faculty who are wanting information on uh, how to implement this from genetic materials and the um, educational modules for your uh, curriculum for faculty, for students. Please register at www.pharmacogenomics.ucsd.edu to download materials. Please note that faculty who have returned to faculty agreement forms um, and have selected the individual modules um, or, and topics uh, will have access to the exact PowerPoint materials as well as all handouts for students. If you have not done so, please contact our office at the contact information provided above. Just a slide on survey instruments and the value for implementation. Faculty trainers who attended the webinars will complete a post-training survey to evaluate knowledge and attitudes and your self-efficacy. And all of the survey materials will be mailed to you um, after completion of all webinars in October 2010. If you have further information, please, I encourage all of you to attend our program implementation webinar that has been mentioned on uh, September 9th. So we will now end with a question and answer session. Uh, if you can please, uh, I will try to repeat the question as they are answered, but if you can um, state your name and where you're from, uh, as well as uh, um, we'll try to answer, uh, uh, Dr. Bishop will also answer the questions and I will try to advance the slides accordingly um, to the exact slide. Any questions? No? <laughs> no, there's got to be questions. Uh, the, can I, um, this is Dr. Kezia Rumer from Turo College of Pharmacy uh, yes. in New York. Um, I enjoyed the presentation and thank you so much for all the effort and time uh, that the team has put together uh, to have this uh, uh, presented. Um, one uh, comment, and I, I do appreciate the fact that um, uh, the, these tests, if and when they've been tested for, uh, currently approved by by the FDA. Uh, concerning the the uh, D2 and the other three uh, genes that um, you alluded to in in your test, how, in terms of trying to advise pharmacies when they go into uh, their practices, this becoming available, is there any format at all that you could suggest uh, for trying to advise on the use of these 
information when they do come about. Um, I believe the question was how to uh, uh, frame these materials for practicing pharmacists. Correct. Okay. Practicing pharmacists or or oh, indeed or student student pharmacists trainees that uh, that are learning this now but may may need to apply Want to use it in the future. Correct. In the future. Yes. So uh, you know I think that's a that's an excellent question and it's something that I get asked a fair amount, particularly with the the psychiatry content where. Um, you know, I think the perspective here is perhaps a little different for the here and now than it is for, say, the, the what, what you'll hear about clopidogrel and warfarin uh, for cardiology as well as some other oncology-related topics where there are uh, tests that are currently available. And I think the way, that, the, what I, the way that I present this to our students is I go over, I review... Um, from a general pharmacogenetic standpoint, I review drugs that have that are currently um, that have current recommendations, which are not the antipsychotic drugs, and the evidence underlying their um, for supporting their use. And then I present the the psychiatry um, antipsychotics uh, as well as antidepressants is something that I teach here. Uh, from the context of, okay, so here's a therapeutic area where they're not yet uh, uniformly, uh, uniform recommendations for testing, but here are the, the, highly, here are the, here are the areas that are highly focused. This is the sta status of the data for the, what I call the usual suspects, which may or may not result in, um, in recommendations for tests, but this gets them uh, exposure to sort of what is the, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it cutting edge or things that are not yet past the threshold of, 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 of clinical implementation but may be on the horizon so that they will be aware of it and understand what some of the data is supporting or not supporting the use is uh, down the road. I think the other thing that I also underscore with, uh, patients or, uh, with, with students and trainees is that uh, there is an increasing number of direct-to-consumer uh, companies and places where you can, where, where a patient can, for four to six hundred bucks, send in a cheek swab or sample their own blood to uh, to receive some sort of drug reaction testing, and they'll get back some report uh, that that may or may not be. Um, with a level of evidence that, that I guess we're not really sure on, but patients may come to the pharmacist asking, what does this mean and how do I interpret it? And I try to inform them of the of sort of what the status of the, you know, current literature is for, for psychiatry-related drugs to, so that they can perhaps make informed decisions for, with, their, with their patients for what that information means or does not mean. So it's more of a... I, I try to put it in, in context of the bigger picture of things that are approved versus things that are not and what's on the horizon and what what types of questions that they will be um, receiving with increased frequency from patients. I think, I think sorry, that was kind of a rambling answer to your question, but that's... that's uh, uh, that, that, that was an excellent, uh, uh, in, in fact, overview of an answer because um, we just concluded um, uh, a course module uh, on um, pharmacogenomics and drug interactions. And uh, uh, the salient point of uh, what you just alluded to were in a very uh, important aspect that I feel um, educators really should you know, be very familiar with in trying to address these issues. And I think as we go on down the line, and as more information are becoming available, then the onus, of course, is if you have practicing pharmacists trying to advise um, patients upon to, I mean, if somebody comes to you and say, well, um, I'm taking this particular drug and I do know that it may or may not interfere to a point, and if you're looking at psychiatry as, uh, as, as one of those clinical conditions that could potentially could be confounding, now is the extent of that information that they're going to have. So it is highly relevant, you know, that we are aware of how to interpret those data, and you're absolutely right on that. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I actually have a question about the antipsychotic associated weight gain and the likelihood of uh, monitoring this in a clinical setting and whether 
What, what, do you, what is your opinion about the likelihood of adoption of these pharmacogenomic tests and monitoring of patients on a daily, day-to-day -day basis, um, considering that I think monitoring of antipsychotic use is um, probably lacking still in most clinical practice? Yes. Yeah, and I, I, well, you, you, you ended with a point that I was going to start with, that uh, uh, monitoring from a metabolic standpoint, that is getting routine blood draws at baseline um, after one month or two months, and then uh, six months and then ideally yearly for antipsychotic drugs is something that is it's currently recommended by um, both the American Psychiatric so Association as well as the uh, American Diabetes Association. Um, but in reality, it's very difficult to, uh, to monitor patients. Um, so I think, and this is for logistical reasons, it's for financial reasons, uh, it's for reasons that you know, you know, perhaps some people don't think it's as necessary um, as, as, as other individuals. Um, now, what, what, so as far as the, the potential influence that um, genetic information may have on this, it, it, it's really hard to say, although, you know, it, perhaps it could help us to focus our metabolic monitoring on those at the highest risk. So if we know that somebody's at the highest risk for, for having their triglycerides or their lipids, um, uh, in, increase or have uh, a lar significantly um, uh, more than average amount of weight gain that may allow that may influence us to perhaps have more frequent monitoring or target monitoring for those individuals um, as opposed that are opposed to those who are, who are at lower risk I, I, I would still uh, advocate for the uniform testing of uh, from a of lipids and basic lab values for all patients, but really the reality is is that it's really difficult to do in clinical practice, and if we can find a way to focus that down, that may, that may, you know, that may get the testing to those who need it most. So as far as the likelihood that this is going to be uh, implemented as a pharmacogenetic test, I really think that what we need is, um, we, we need studies like, um, you know, randomizing people who have a who have a, a, a HTR to to see T allele to receive olanzapine, uh, so those are the ones that would be less likely to gain weight. And if they're at a high likelihood to gain weight, then they get randomized to something that has lower likelihood for weight gain. And then you compare outcomes over time, and uh, you see if you can reduce morbidity by uh, through through drug selection based on genotyping. I I just don't think we have that yet. And furthermore, another barrier is that as I presented most of the studies that, that, that um, uh, relate to serotonin 2C receptors, and those are mostly focused on olanzapine and clozapine. And, those are, and, the, and the, the nice part of that from a science standpoint is that those are the drugs with the greatest effect sizes seen from weight. So therefore, you're having uh, your, your outcome variable as the has the the most movement, and therefore you're going to be able to see the most differences across genotypes. The the other part of that is is that you know currently I'd say those drugs are probably reserved for later in treatment. So um, you know that that kind of affects your risk benefit ratio that that you, you may be able to derive from genotype information. So if you're you know you're going to need to be using clozapine regardless of whether somebody gains weight or not. Um, you know that diminishes the the overall impact of of, uh, of the information you receive from genotype. So, um, so I think we, it'll be it'd be helpful to have more data on other drugs. So I, I know there's some a recent publication out on iloperidone, which is a new which is one of the newer um, approved antipsychotic drugs. It has a weight gain profile that's very similar to ziprazidone. So some people gain some weight. Um, on average, I would say that it's a lot less than um, for those two drugs than olanzapine and clozapine. Uh, they showed that the, the serotonin T C to C receptor was associated with some weight gain in a subpopulation of those patients. So um, having more information on other drugs will make this more broadly applicable and increase the likelihood that um, we would be able to get a viable pharmacogenetic test that's clinically useful out of that. Great. That's Thank my. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. That was great. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. If there are no additional questions, we would like to thank all the attendees for your participation today and Dr. Bishop for his presentation. If questions arise in the future, please contact us at pharmacogenomics at ucsd.edu or visit our website at pharmacogenomics.ucsd.edu. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.